Namo Buddhaya. What about uh, sexuality? More to the point, sexual desire. How do you deal with that if you are looking to renounce, give up lay life and become a monk or a nun? This is a question I'm asked more often than you can imagine and um, I'm happy to answer. Now please, I'm answering this from the perspective of a, um, can you say formally heterosexual? I suppose technically I would still be considered heterosexual um, male and not from the perspective, point of view or experience of any other kind of gender orientation, albeit I'm sure the experience is the same. So please forgive me if I'm talking from solely this male perspective. It is not misogynism, it is not uh, sexism, it is a case of talking from my own experience. And in fact, it probably that goes without saying. Uh, however, I'm not always sure uh, the uh, sex or the sexual orientation of the people asking questions because I just have a name which is often a not a real name so and even that if it's a different language who, who can tell it is largely irrelevant when entering monasticism part of our renunciation is that sex just that we become celibate but we'll go on to that in the rest of this video. So let's get to the beginning before we can really understand and answer this question about dealing with desire. Because sexual desire is just another desire like any other. There are two main would you say carnal or animal desires in res resonant in human nature, which are to survive, for the human species to survive. So this is the first desire actually, so there's one. But this is made up of two things. Um, to eat, uh, to feed yourself, uh, and to procreate, to make other human beings. Then, of course, with those comes other uh, attached desires to protect what you have. So this is where fighting and war and things come from. Uh, to keep what you have, which is where selfishness and uh, to some extent greed comes from and so on and so forth. Essentially what we're dealing with there is the root defilements of greed, hatred and delusion. Delusion really just being a misunderstanding of the first two, greed and hatred and all that we associate with in our lives. So the Buddha taught that suffering and the end of suffering and specific, specifically in the Four Noble Truths that there is suffering, a cause of suffering, an end of suffering and the path leading to the end of suffering. Normally at this point I jump straight to the path leading to the end of suffering because that brings about the way of diminishing uh, uh, under uh, undercutting, uh, eroding, getting rid of the cause, those three elements of greed, hatred and delusion. <clears throat> so that Noble Eightfold Path we would normally then break down into the practice of Sila which is a moral virtue, Samadhi which is meditation and Panya which is the development of the mind or wisdom specifically right view, right intention, 
right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. But I'm not going to do that today. We're going to get to the point. That is the point, that is the practice, sila samadhi panya. panya. But why? Why are we suffering? Um, because, as the Buddha said, there is a cause. So, for noble truth number two, there is a cause of suffering. What is the cause of suffering? I ask you, but I'm not going to get an immediate answer back. <laughs> the cause of suffering is desire. How have you dress it up? Um, it is expectation, it is hope, it is disappointment, it's all of these things. But we'll look at it right now, how desire works. Firstly, this can be broken into two parts. There are two forms of desire. I have some Pali words. I try not to use too many Pali words, but some Pali words are very useful because they're more descriptive. We have one word for desire, for instance. In the Pali, there are two which is how I can break desire into two things. I could just say there's wholesome desire and unwholesome desire. But that gives an association to some desires which don't really seem morally wrong or unwholesome. Like for instance, the desire to have um, a pizza and a beer whilst watching a movie uh, this evening is not immorally wrong thing to do. Nothing wrong with that at all, and quite a common practice on, uh, I think, a Saturday night. Um, unwholesome though it is, uh, to have the intention to sit, meditate, or listen to some Dharma would be considered a wholesome desire. So, unwholesome desires are described in the Pali word tanha which is like thirst and is more associated with craving. And you know craving has no positive connotations. It is a kind of, ugh, <laughs> I need this, I really want this. Um, it's not a, oh, I'm looking forward to having that later. Um, so it's that craving, grabbing, um, that can cause a lot of problems and a lot of suffering directly. <coughs> Excuse me. The other form of desire is chanda, which is more a wholesome desire that I have this desire to develop my mind, to practice meditation and to lead a morally virtuous lifestyle. I want to help others. I have enormous compassion for say, different animals that I'd like to assist. This is a desire of course, a strong desire in many people but it's a positive, wholesome desire. So it's just separating the two. Now the desire we're talking about today is tanha, craving, thirst. Why do we become monks? Let's answer that first of all. We would wish to become free of suffering within this lifetime. So we're like taking the fast track towards, if you want to call it enlightenment, you can call it that, or the path to Nibbana. Why is it the fast track? Because we get rid of a lot of the obstacles that we face as human beings with human nature, with those carnal desires of wanting to procreate and to feed ourselves and to protect and survive. We get rid of a lot of those uh, tanhas, those, chan those, those desires, those cravings, those what we consider needs but are only wants. You only want a pizza and a beer and to watch a movie. You don't need that. If you're hungry, rice and dal will do. For instance, for most of two and a half years just recently in India, I've not been in the monastery, so I've been living outside, relying on a meal called prasad, which is the sort of the Indian equivalent of the English soup kitchen. But rather than soup and bread, you get rather thin dal, and rice, rice and dal, and that's um, that's being nice. But it's 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 good. It's substantial. It's clean. It's fresh. It's uh, wholesome. There's some vegetables, but nothing much. Um, 
but you can survive, you get rid of hunger. You still have the desire to eat that in the morning so it never gets boring because you're hungry. As you know, we only eat once a day, so there are no other options really um, when you're needing your food to be offered for a monk living outside than to do that. So I had no problems there with that. Uh, nutritionally I have suffered admittedly and I'm now having to catch up <laughs> with some, I have a little bag of goodies here which I must finish before 12 o'clock today which are, going, are replenishing my uh, missing nutrients um, after quite a while. So uh, this um, is the need to eat and it is satisfied by supplying food and then that need has gone and one would get used to this situation and there is no suffering but now and just take this is how this actually came up for talking to you about this today um, every day the food we go on arms round the food is the rice is put in your bowl to its maximum capacity in fact overflowing and other foods are offered and an uh, assistant comes along with us, a lay person, collecting it all together. It's brought back to the monastery where more is offered and then we sit the monks on a little platform and it's pushed along after it's offered on little trolleys. But you never know when the trolley train will end because the trolleys go this way and that way out there and then can be replenished and continue. So what do you do? Do you <laughs> Do you hope if you just put a little bit of the first thing that comes along, because it all looks very nice and tasty, um, do you just put a little bit in and hope some more comes? Or do you max out just in case it doesn't? This is greed um, showing itself, manifesting itself in me, the monk. This is more because I've been used to having to like struggle a little bit with the getting food and eating and not used to the choice and supply that is offered in a place like this. Then once you get used to the amounts, then comes the next problem. As I've been here now a couple of weeks, I can describe this to you. The next problem is you kind of know what's coming next, some nice things, and then sometimes they don't, and sometimes they do. And there's lots of nice things. And then you have choice. Now, what are you thinking about now? It's not just satisfying your hungry and get hunger and getting out of there and getting back to your meditation is it? It's, I wonder if that delicious thing will come today, or should I have two of this delicious thing? Now this is then suffering, because you've, you've got choice. Um, it's suffering as a result of tanha, not as a result of being hungry. And okay, it's a mild form of suffering, but it can be emotionally affecting and it can come up in your practice of meditation. Thoughts of the meal you had this morning and the meal you're going to have tomorrow. Do I have take too much? Have I taken too little? So why is monasticism the fast track? Well, because we are firstly given this situation to control those two desires, the worst kind. Worst is the wrong word. The most difficult kind to control. And that is eating and sexual desire. Hu not hunger, but just food in itself, the enjoyment of food, the desire, the tanha, the first, the craving for food, nice food, food you like, not necessarily just need, and sexual desire. So food is dealt with by us only eating once a day, what we collect on arms round, and after that, midday comes, no more eating. So at least only part of our day is given to that desire. It can't overtake the mind then until the following day when one goes on arms round. Here we've eaten by eight o'clock, um, well 8.30, quarter to nine. Okay I brought a couple of the like um, milk things. I didn't have much milk when I was in. I went a bit vegan, out of choice in India, um, but I'm kind of having to sort of make balance things out so I have some yogurt things in there. But I won't have anything after midday obviously. Um, so this choice then causes this, this little bit of, uh, uh, not anxiety, overthinking about something that doesn't need to be thought about. 
because you can satisfy your nutritional needs very quickly, very easily, very simply. And the, pr the living the monastic life enables that to that that part of desire to be eradicated quite quickly. So I've taken just two extremes of monasticism there um, to sort of demonstrate. But once you establish yourself in a place for a while, you then get back to your old habits and you settle down into a routine. And sexual desire, monks are, and when I say monks, I mean monastics, sex, nuns, all sorts of whatever, are celibate. So there is, let's look at the precepts, the five precepts of uh, no killing, no stealing, and then refraining from sexual, sorry, refraining from sexual misconduct for lay people is the third precept. That's another question. Now, sexual misconduct, uh, just quickly go there. Um, it says nothing in the Buddha's teachings about whom you're having sex with, whether it's uh, opposite sex, same sex, or however many partners um, in a lifetime or at one time you have. It doesn't say anything about that. It purely says that one must respect each other in the way that I like to sum it up by it must be a mutually um, beneficial and agreeable uh, transaction if you like. Um, you're, it, it is uh, an act taken part in uh, for each other, uh, to, for no one's um, benefit or gain other than mutual gratification. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, anything like uh, teacher to student, boss to uh, employee, th this, this kind of thing is, an, is a no-no. If you're in a fixed relationship to, dependent on the country, your the laws and the rules around your marital relations, if you're in a marriage then one should not commit adultery outside of marriage um, because of course that is clearly going to upset the other party. So this is what it's referring to, refraining from sexual misconduct. Obvious I know, but I, I do get asked this. Um, in, and then of course the other two precepts are no lying and no taking of intoxicants. But for monastics, the third, and as soon as you go to stay in a monastery, when you take eight precepts, the third precept changes to no sexual activity whatsoever and then the next three are no eating after noon which we've just discussed after midday no entertainment or beautification and dressing up and makeup and earrings and necklaces and listening to music and singing and dancing and no sleeping in a high luxurious bed sleeping place that's the eight precepts which anyone coming to stay even for a day or a few days, as they do here in the only positive days, lay people come to monasteries and stay for 24 hours and take the eight precepts. I say here, I don't think anyone is doing that here. I, I'm not sure whether they may be in the other section with the, the, the nuns and more mechis, so I don't know. I think there's always someone, lay people, staying here. I'm very separate from everybody in this kuti. It's very, I'm very fortunate, it's very nice like that. So monastics have this situation, but the question is from the people wanting to become monastics, well how do I deal with all that sexual desire? It is there, um, of course. The same way as we deal with that desire for the pizza and a beer and a movie on a Saturday night, it is the same thing. Um, if you feed it, you'll want it more. If you have a pizza and a beer, you'll want the same next Saturday, or even you might want it sooner. Or even it might not be enough and you'll want more on that same day. This is the same with sexual desire. Desire is like fire, yes? Fire and desire rhyme. Nibbana is, means cooling. It actually literally translates to cool down. And this is what we're heading for, Nibbana, which means a whole lot of other things, but the literal translation of the Pali word is to cool down. Be cool, 
unagitated, not hot, not all fired up. What do all these craving desires, tanhas, give us? They fire us up, they get us heated, they get us... It's the hunting instinct, the going out and getting instinct, coming up through our, our nature, our human nature. And we're looking to cool that. Now, if you think, okay, well, I'll just have one bit of pizza, or I'll have just one little bit of sexual relations, or I'll have just uh, one glass of wine, yes, it's okay. And you may be super disciplined, and that's okay, as a layperson. None of those things are morally wrong anyway. As a layperson, you can do all of those things. But it isn't the case. You generally want more of a good thing. Because these are good things. That's why we do them. That's why we want them. We don't need them, we want them. They're made good in order for the species to survive. For us, food tastes nice to make us eat it. Sex is good to make us do it. This is how the human race is here today. So we must be very grateful for it. It's not a problem, and there's nothing morally wrong with any of it. But reminding you of the question is, how do you then become a, a monk or a nun? Because you've still got these, this baggage, if you like. Well, you have to just jump in at the deep end and trust the practice. Because, like a fire, if you add fuel to it, the fire will increase. And outside there, in the world, there is a lot of fuel from increasing your desire for the pizza, beer and a movie to increasing your desire for a woman or a man. It's all out there, in your face, on the TV, on your phone even, everywhere, all of the time. Even without those things, with each other, interpersonal relationships, men with women, women with men, women and women, men and men, so on and so forth. It's there. In the monastery, it isn't. And for a long time, as a trainee, as a even a bhikkhu, you're not allowed out of the monastery. So you're only with monks. There is no media, there is no TV, there is no movies. And you have Dharma talks, you have meditation. So to some extent, you're not, you're, you're not looking at it, you're not adding fuel to the fire. But you're also not suppressing it. Don't get me wrong, you must not try and suppress what is only naturally human. But what you must do is understand it. And when I say understand it, understand that the desire will arise. It may hang around a little while, but it will go away. And when it does, you can congratulate yourself to say, I didn't act upon that desire. I didn't go and get that pizza, that beer, or watch that movie. I just sat here, saved all that money, and I'm actually not hungry. Didn't I do well? Or, if it's the other matter, you didn't do whatever you were going to do to satisfy that desire. And either thing wouldn't have done any harm to anyone. I agree. But in terms of cooling, reducing desires for the future, it wouldn't achieve that. It would only add fuel, even if it's only subtle and underlying to those desires for the future. Now take yourself to the end of your life. You heard me speak yesterday or the day before, maybe a week ago now, about the man I went to watch dying. This is Upositor. So tonight, I think, we're going to see the dead man. I think probably Nisichik, which is the all-night sitting practice that monks do. We stay up all night on the Upositor, meditating. We will be doing, well, just me and this other monk, one other monk. Um, meditating with this this dead man yes so <clears throat> this is a practice in Thailand it's to really generate the sense of urgency in our practice this is why monasticism is the fast track method towards becoming free from suffering so Marinuna Sati the, the contemplation of death is very important not in a morbid way but as the true reality of our existence. So tonight when I'm with uh, this man, I will be looking, seeing how a week of worths of decay and what have you has gone on and understanding that this is me in a few years time. It's you also and the monk next to me 
and whoever's going to be making the coffee, I hope, all night long. Um, this is a contemplative meditation. It's very real. It's there for the reason of giving us a sense of urgency, because the Buddha said the days and nights re are marching relentlessly on how well are you spending your time? And I've probably got those words quite quite wrong, and some monks can quote it in Pali and all sorts, but along those lines, how well are you spending your time? And I've mentioned this before on these day before Zuposita day, on the 15th, 14th, 15th days of the month, as I see how quickly the last 15 days has gone by, how much have I spent that time in meditation, in contemplation? How much have I spent that time reflecting on each each day on what I've done that day. This practice of being with the dead, understanding the nature of this, brings us back into the real nature of our impermanent bodies. And therefore, an understanding <coughs> of this desire and the problems it can cause. Because, let's say we've always satisfied that desire of this pizza, beer and movie, or gone out and satisfy our our sexual desires <clears throat> with others or alone. However, when you get to this end of life situation, if you are um, unfortunate enough to be hanging around for some time, um, or even if you just get to an age and are quite healthy in other respects, many of these activities that you enjoy now will not be available to you, either physically from yourself or certainly from the point of view of others joining in with you. But if you've fueled that desire all of your life, then you are going to have an element of suffering to deal with at that stage of events. And it's a suffering because it's a desire at that point then that you cannot satisfy. So these Tanha desires, thirst desires, are all insatiable, unsatisfiable, which is why they are dukkha, unsatisfactory. Whereas the desire to meditate or leave a vir lead a virtuous lifestyle is something that is achievable. You can always meditate, it doesn't run out and it doesn't cost anything, and even on your last breath you can be observing that breath. And if you've learned how to, enjoying that breath. As much as the pizza, the beer, and the movie, and the other things. So if you've arrived at the end of your life with all of those pleasures in that one breath, in, even if you're dead before the breath out, you've died smiling. You couldn't have had the pizza, the beer, and the movie, or the lady in the bed with you, or the man, or the whatever. But you've always got the breath. And the practical aspect of developing this cooling of that desire is just a matter of shielding, guarding our sense doors of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking about these things. If you spend your day looking at pictures of pizza, beer and movies, smelling the cooking pizzas and tasting, imagining the taste of beer and all of these things, you're going to be fueling that desire. So you divert your attention away from that and your conscious awareness towards something wholesome. If it's too difficult for you to concentrate on your meditation object, uh, as a result of the overwhelming desire for some kind of food or gratification, then you can either listen to the Dharma or you can take the opposite approach. This is where death contemplation comes into being. I'll use the example of a man and a woman because this is my experience. If you see a beautiful woman, which you do not see when you're in the monastery, but if you're going out and you are to go into the wrong sort of places and see perhaps uh, on beaches, for instance, public beaches, there's a very nice private little beach here. No one's allowed there, just these two, two three monks. Um, 
but if I was to go a little way up the road I'm sure there would be beaches with uh, ladies with next to nothing wearing on. Didn't say that right. <laughs> but uh, as a monk you don't really go to these places. There's been situations where I've had to pass through these places often. Not so much a problem in India because there were no tourists for the whole time I was there mainly. It was generally been Covid time and the Indian men and ladies wear full clothes on the beach, even in the sea, swimming. No nakedness going on at all. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that either. It's normal, it's human, and it's fun. I've been a monk for a very short time and a lay person and an a, a ordinary human being for many, many years. Um, but if you go seeing all of that sort of thing, these desires will be fueled. If you're not seeing it, they won't be. But if you see this, and it's a problem, because of course one can see these things in your mind, uh, then you can use the techniques that we are taught. And in our ordination, uh, we are actually given a little mantra, um, which is the Pali words for hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin. These are the outwardly apparent, so Kesa Loma Nacha Tako, no, Kesa Loma Nacha Danta Tako. The, the, these are the outward apparent objects we see when we see a man or a lady. Um, what are those things? Oh, this lady, she's got beautiful hair. Now, if you look in the, the bath plug at her house, in the hole, there's all this hair and soap, and you pick it out like this. And you wouldn't want to go, mmm, nice hair, with this hair, because it's, it's dead body there in the bath hole plug thing. Nails, beautiful nails, beautiful nails. But if someone clips their nails off and leaves the clippings on the floor, oh, please clear that up. It's not nice. Um, and then we age. People aren't beautiful for long. One day you'll be looking at your wife and you'll, she'll smile with beautiful teeth. It won't be long one day you'll look at your wife, she'll smile and she'll go and take them out. Put them in a glass, bloop, right next to you in the bed. Oh, what are you going to do? <laughs> this is what we have to realize. And by being with the aged, by being with the dying, by being with the dead, it comes to reality. What these bodies are, they're bags of skin. And in our chanting, we, ch we chant, and here the Thai lay people also chant this, not just the monastics. They chant the 32 body parts, which is, the chanting starts with, this is a bag of skin filled with, and then we go through the bowels, the entrails, the intestines, the pus, the mucus, the saliva, the blood, the sputum, the urine, the feces, everything, in Pali and Thai. And it's 32 parts, so it takes a little while of chanting every night, reminding you of what these beautiful bodies are. This thinking isn't suppressing sexual desire. It is making you see it for what it is, just a craving for a moment of satisfaction, which is in fact totally unsatisfying because it only generates more desire for more, adds fuel to the fire, the fire of desire, how unrealistic it is. This is why relationships sadly end because of, of face, fa uh, this, this uh, failing attraction, not because of failing love. Couples who love each other very much still stray to members, you know, other partners, because they see a prettier woman or a more handsome, younger, fitter man. However, they still love their husband, they still love their wife, but this overwhelming sexual desire pulls them in a very unwholesome direction and causes all sorts of upset. And this is what we learn through monasticism to understand. And by understanding it, you'd be surprised how quickly you overcome that need 
which isn't really a need, you overcome that craving, that tanha, that desire for sexual activity. The structure within which you live is supportive. The Vinaya, all of the rules that we have, 227 of them, uh, are supportive uh, to help or ensure you maintain that celibacy also. And without going into detail, I mean, even the way we dress, the way we bathe, the way we go to the toilet, it is all done in a very uh, mindful and systemized manner that isn't cumbersome or clumsy. It is quite beautiful, but makes you very aware of the very unattractive nature of the body and other people's bodies without losing affection for other people. In fact, when you diminish sexual desire, you increase metta, loving kindness, compassion, modita, uh, mutual, um, modita, uh, sympathetic joy, that is. And these three of the Brahma Viharas, metta, karuna, modita, increase when sexual desire reduces. When sexual desire is increased, they decrease because metta loving kindness is the wrong kind of love. It's lust, nothing to do with loving kindness or metta. Compassion is purely selfish. You might just want to satisfy the needs of another to make yourself feel good about your own sexual prowess, for instance. And joy in others' joy is not really that it's joy that you've made them have a good time. So it's bringing all of this stuff back to that egotistical self. This is what sexual sexuality, sexual desire brings about in a person. There is nothing wrong with it, it is normal. And on the five precepts, if everybody kept the free five precepts in the entire world, we would all be living in peace and harmony and love happily ever after. It's just a case of keeping that mutual positivity and agreement within a loving relationship for where sexual activity takes place or in many relationships if that's agreeable or alone. However, there is no place for it in monasticism because it is an aspect that slows down the progress towards enlightenment. So I hope I've answered that. I've got a clock today. I have spoken for longer than I anticipated for. I had a clock here in order that I could try and stop after 20 minutes, but it's not possible. <laughs> um, maybe, I didn't really pay attention to what the time was when I started. So the <clears throat> the point being, when, as a lay person, when you're uh, having the desire for uh, pizza, beer and a movie, you can use a similar principle of looking at the negative side. We desire this uh, taste, we desire the effect. If you look at the effect of the beer the next day afterwards, or the effect it may have of wanting another one and another one and then it leading to a whole lot of trouble, or even you just look at the principle of a pizza. Well, it's nice when you pick it out of the box, it's nice when you put it in your mouth, but if you chew a bit up and spit it back out on the plate, do you really want it? No. This is again a way of not suppressing the desire, but putting you off. Like imagining your beautiful woman or beautiful man as an old man or a dead man or an old woman or a dead woman or a woman whose hair's falling out and teeth are rotten, or a man whose eyes have gone all white and gooey, then, you know, it helps with the softening of that desire, and therefore the dampening of the fire, and you cooling towards Nibbana. As monks, the surroundings, the practice, the rules, the Vinaya, that is, um, and our lifestyle does that for us. So we can concentrate on watching our mind and seeing when these things arise 
how they manifest, how long they stay, and watching them pass away in the assurity that we know that they will. And by not acting upon those desires, we don't add further fuel to the fire. So very quickly, those desires, I'm not saying they don't arise at all, but the need to act on them does not arise, um, and the desires arise, arise less often. And in fact, you develop so much more overwhelming metta, karuna and modita for all beings. Seeing all beings uh, and human beings like your brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. Um, and this kind of love is not a sexual love. Uh, this kind of love is a mutually beneficial relationship and all beings become that when you adapt your um, your tanha and cool it into chanda which is this wholesome desire so all people don't become all walking skeletons or bags of skin they become the same as you. You are as much a person as that is a person and you are, aren't just one thing necessarily but you have the respect for them and the love and the compassion for them without that attached attraction. It doesn't become an issue. So for anyone deciding or thinking about monasticism, if that's an obstacle, the way it works anyway is one starts in a monastery for just a few days and then you go away and then you try for a little longer, usually a few weeks, and then you go away and then if you're allowed, because they watch you, they look after you, then you come back and you try for longer. So it's not really jumping in at the deep end, it's putting your toe in the water and trying it out. You can try it at home. It's a little more, more difficult in the outside world, but if you're going to succeed there, you could succeed anywhere. Um, uh, these things, phones, social media, not that, that, not social media, I don't know anything much about that to comment apart from this, this thing, YouTube thing. Um, but um, what, are you, what are you thinking? What am I thinking? What do you see? Oh, TV, adverts like that come on the TV all of the time. God, I haven't seen a TV advert for such a long time, so I can't imagine what they are about now. But I'd imagine the same things, yeah, toothpaste or, um, I don't know, new cars, um, shop, big shirt furniture shops. They used to have in January adverts for furniture shops, I remember, bed shops, lots of the adverts for those in, the, in January. Like everybody in January has to get new beds and new furniture, so they make everything half price which seems to always be half price throughout the year if you ever go to these shops. This kind of thing. You know, this is all very disturbing. So don't watch all that kind of thing. Watch the television station that doesn't have those adverts. And if you have YouTube, you can get this thing called I Have It, because in India it's very cheap. YouTube Premium. You don't get any adverts. That's why I um, uh, have that. So if I watch a Dharma talk, then, uh, mind you, monks talking, I don't think they get any adverts anyway, because who's going to want to advertise with us? We're telling you not to buy anything at all. You don't need anything. So surely no one advertises on my um, talkings. <laughs> if they do, I'd be interested to know what they're advertising, because I can tell you now, you don't need it. Oh, that's probably got me banned. I better stop talking. <clears throat> it is time to go. <laughs> um, but we don't need most of the things we think we want. Uh, or the things, most of the things we think we need is just we want. And it's wanting that is the cause of suffering. Desire is that second noble truth, the cause of suffering. And this noble eightfold path of meditation, of sorry, see a good virtue, modern moral virtue, meditation and developing our minds is, uh, is working towards reducing desire. But specifically, knowing that it's desire that is the cause of suffering is a good way towards um, making big inroads on this battle towards reducing and eradicating greed, hatred and delusion. 
and ultimately attaining to freedom from suffering in this lifetime and for you I hope ultimately with your practice being enjoyable and leading you towards Nibbana. So there I will say uh, goodbye. I had learnt to say goodbye in Thai this morning but now I've forgotten it already and that is age for you. This is uh, <laughs> Anicca, this is Dukkha, this is suffering um, and Anatta, it's out of my control. I fully knew how to say goodbye and now I can't even imagine how to begin to say goodbye in Thai. It's a difficult language but for a person of my age it's even harder. So I'll say my usual thing, Namo Buddha.